My name is Thomas McAleer. I'm a physician who's board certified in the specialty of internal medicine. I've been in practice of internal medicine for 31 years in the Toledo, Ohio metropolitan area. As an internal medicine specialist, I have been trained to diagnose and manage a number of very common and very chronic diseases, almost all of which are on the increase during the course of our lifetime, certainly, and as well over the last 100 years or so. In fact, many of these diseases have reached epidemic proportions, and all you have to do is look around at your friends and neighbors to recognize that we're not doing a particularly good job treating them. Diseases that I specifically treat include heart disease, stroke, and that includes all forms of cerebrovascular disease, cancers primarily of the breast and the colorectal tract, as well as the prostate. Obesity, which is clearly a significant epidemic in our time. Hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and disorders of lipid metabolism. Dementia, another scourge that's clearly on the increase. Many autoimmune diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, asthma and allergies, and inflammatory joint diseases as well. My message is that all or almost all of these uh, seemingly disparate chronic diseases that are on an increase over the course of our lifetime are caused by, to an overwhelming extent, by our terribly toxic Western diet. A diet that is, relies primarily on animal byproducts or foods made directly from animals, highly refined foods, and heavily processed foods and oils. In my training, I didn't have much emphasis on the diet. And what I've learned over the course of the last few years of my career is that it's a strong connection directly, and the link to these diseases is so scientifically sound that it's actually become a much bigger impact for the practice of medicine in my personal practice. In effect, our diet is sickening and killing us in record numbers. I came about this information almost by accident. I had had very little training in medical school about nutrition or the effects of nutrition on human health. And I was about 25 years into my practice and I was facing an epidemic, uh, an overwhelming epidemic of a variety of very common diseases. My patients over time were obese, they were hypertensive, they had high cholesterol, they had heart disease, they were being treated for autoimmune disorders. We were giving them increasingly higher volumes of medication, and I wasn't seeing significant improvement in their overall health, and I certainly wasn't doing much to reduce the burden of illness that was present. It was a frustrating and somewhat disillusioning period of time. You know, I'd been trained to use traditional pharmaceuticals, medications, if you will, pills, to treat all of my patients' ills, and I recognized that that just wasn't working. The results were very disheartening. My fat patients were getting fatter. My diabetic patients were actually having progression of their diabetes in spite of the fact that I was putting them on two, sometimes three, sometimes more medications. My patients with heart disease were requiring more stents, more surgery, or were having sudden cardiac events that resulted in their death, in spite of the fact that all the modern technology that my training had encouraged me to provide for them was being provided. My patients with high cholesterol were continuing to have high lipid values, in spite of the fact that I was putting them on a variety of different medications to lower the cholesterol. And at about this time, my own health began to suffer. I was uh, great gaining weight. The, uh, my weight was as high as it had ever been at the time. I was in to have a physical examination and my cholesterol had risen for the first time in my life over 200. It had never been that high before. My blood pressure at one point was high enough that I was taking blood pressure medications. And I began to see in myself the same slippery slope that my patients were on. And I recognized that I needed to do something, but I needed some other information, I needed some other idea in order to treat this problem. 
And about that time, a real fortuitous event occurred. A cousin of mine, who's my age and a, and a close friend of mine, called me up one day on the telephone. And he is somewhat health conscious, and he wondered if it were possible for me to watch a documentary about uh, a diet that he was going to consider. What he wanted was my opinion as a healthcare professional about the safety of this diet and its effectiveness. Well, <laughs> I didn't have time to watch a documentary, so I blew him off. And about a week later in the mail, he sent me a DVD of, a doc of the documentary itself, seemingly encouraging me to not have any other excuses to watch it. And he also sent me a book that was a, a, a dietary advice book. It was written by one of the pioneers in this diet. And he wanted me to read that. And about a week after that, he sent me a text. And so after the nagging, I finally sat down one January Saturday morning, and I watched a critical, I think, uh, documentary entitled Forks Over Knives. And understand at the time that I saw this documentary, I was ripe for a change. Um, I was concerned about my own health. I was, as I said, frustrated in my career that I wasn't able to help my patients. I certainly wasn't able to cure uh, their chronic diseases. And for the next 90 minutes, I learned a story about how the Western diet affects all of the chronic diseases that I had been treating for at that time up to about 25 years. And it was what I'll call my nutritional epiphany. Uh, at the end of the documentary, I was slack-jawed. Uh, it was as if the curtain of ignorance was lifted. I began to clearly connect all of these pieces and I immediately put the plan into action for my own health. Um, I decided that the test case should be me. Can I eat this way? Uh, does it have any beneficial effect? Uh, what was the downside to changing my, from my traditional American diet to a plant-based diet? And what I found out was uh, nothing short of amazing. Over a three-month period of time, I lost approximately 24 pounds. I currently weigh what I weighed when I was a junior in high school. Uh, my cholesterol fell 50 points. My blood pressure dropped about 20 millimeters of mercury, and I no longer needed blood pressure medication. I felt very healthy. I uh, found no evidence of any weakening or any impairment in my level of function or my vigor and I was very pleased with the results. The weight loss was unintentional. I, I didn't think I needed to lose weight, but evidently I did. So the next step was, can I integrate this now into my practice? Um, I can preach what I practice. Can I help shepherd my patients to improvements in their own health? Can I lead them, I guess? Can I at least provide some impetus to make some significant changes in the health outside of what modern healthcare would suggest for them. <laughs> Where do I start? Um, modern healthcare. I have to start, I guess, by saying that uh, modern healthcare does a lot of things well, and I'm not anti-healthcare. Uh, we have antibiotics to treat a variety of infectious diseases now, and uh, virtually uh, correct almost any of the known pathogens. Orthopedic surgery renders people free from chronic joint disease and the pain and debility associated with it. If there's orthopedic trauma, most of that trauma can be corrected. Uh, Surgical emergencies, such as having your gallbladder out or your appendix out or uh, diverticulitis and bowel obstructions can be managed very easily and effectively. And new technologies to monitor heart rhythms, to replace heart valves, to uh, monitor patients for uh, uh, critical illness from uh, the distance, even from, from outside the hospital, are allowing us to flourish with disorders that we previously haven't. But in the area that I practice, in the area of chronic health disease, we really do a lousy job. I mentioned earlier how frustrating this was to me, and I didn't actually recognize why at the time. Someone once likened it to uh, using the wrong tool. Uh, if your job is to take a broken light bulb out of the socket and you're handed a screwdriver, you probably could do it, but it's not the most easy job. And that's what we're doing with chronic health, uh, chronic medical diseases. We're, we're trying to use prescription pharmaceuticals to treat the problems, and that is not the actual solution. 
Currently, in modern healthcare, as it comes to chronic disease, the focus is on treatment, not on prevention. In fact, we incentivize doctors and healthcare systems to perform procedures and not to educate patients. We focus on a cure rather than a prevention mentality. The technology is all focused on treating the chronic disease and trying to cure it. We're not looking at it from the perspective of how do we not get here in the first place. There's really no incentive, quite frankly, to keep people healthy. Healthcare systems, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies make a tremendous profit in managing chronic diseases. If there were no chronic diseases, where would the money come from? The other thing I think that's wrong with our current healthcare system is that it's brutally expensive. Every year we're paying higher premiums, pharmaceutical costs are higher, the deductibles that we pay are higher, the co-pays that we pay are higher. And with this increased cost is really not coming an increase in our overall health. In fact, in my practice, I face a daily economic battle for my patients. Uh, what is the cost of this medication? Will it be paid for by my insurance company? Can I afford the copay? If you're adding a second or third or fourth or tenth drug, is it something that the patient is even going to consider taking when it comes to the cost of all of these medications? And, and, and the, the testing, quite frankly, that accompanies it. If I'm treating your diabetes, I am going to be sending you to the lab to monitor your kidney function. I'm going to monitor your overall control of your diabetes. For many of my patients, every lab visit results in a copay. For my patients who are underinsured, quite frankly, they make an economic decision and they'll skip certain medications and they'll put up with a little bit more disease. What we're getting for our money is, quite frankly, very little when it comes to the treatment of chronic disease. And here's the worst part. The overwhelming number of the chronic diseases can't be cured by modern medicine. None of the medications that are on the market right now for the treatment of type 2 diabetes cures the disease. All they're focused on is reducing the blood sugar, getting the blood sugar into the normal range. There's really no economic incentive to do, do so. Uh, if you're a healthcare system, if you are a pharmaceutical company, if you're an insurance company, it's good business to treat people for chronic disease. If you're curing chronic diseases, it's good health, but it isn't necessarily good business. What do I suggest? Well, the science for what I'm about to discuss with you is overwhelming and irrefutable. What I'm suggesting we do is we switch, or at least consider switching, to an ideal diet for humans. This ideal diet will correct, cure, and prevent an overwhelming number of the chronic diseases which I treat and which we currently suffer from. Specifically, what I'm recommending is what's called a whole foods, plant-based diet. This is a much more sophisticated approach than a standard vegan diet. And I'll give you an example. Uh, French fry is technically vegan food. And you take a potato and if you soak it in boiling sunflower oil or vegetable oil, technically you still have a plant-based food. But the saturated fats that are forced into that potato are precisely the type of processing that we want to avoid. The saturated fats, for instance, cause oxidative damage to the arteries in the body that leads to the atherosclerosis, and the excessive saturated fat cause fatty deposition in the uh, muscle cells as well as the fat cells in the body, and that fat deposition along with the effectiveness of the saturated fat at limiting the ability of insulin to draw glucose into the cells is what contributes to the diabetes. So what I'm specifically referring to is a diet that is low in fat, high in fiber, avoids processing and refining of foods. It's comprised of whole natural foods. Starches primarily are the base. Beans, rice, corn, potatoes, vegetables of all types, any fruit uh, that is available, and nuts and seeds in small amounts. This is the ideal diet for the human, and it is clearly the diet, scientifically proven to be the diet, that optimizes human health. We are at our best, we live the most healthy, we live the longest when we eat this type of diet.
Humans are remarkably adaptable. You know, modern man has been on this planet for 200,000 years, and uh, we have survived because we can eat a variety of sources of nutrition. But just because we can live on animal-based foods doesn't mean that it doesn't give us disease. We can eat this food and survive. We've been around for generations, but what we're seeing now are the consequences of an increased amount of processing of food based on the food industry and a significant increase in the amount of animal-based sources of nutrition. For optimum health, humans should eat plants. Let me give you an example. Uh, species, all species on this planet have an optimal diet. A horse, for instance, the optimal diet for that horse are a variety of grasses. You can give a horse a can of Coca-Cola and it might eat it, but that's not optimal food. We are, as humans, primates. Primates are not carnivores. The way that our jaw works, the, the shape of our teeth, uh, primates are plant eaters. And the further we stray from the natural, ideal food, the more we are to devolve into these diseases that we see today. The type of diet that most of us eat is so far away from what the natural world or the natural order of things would suggest that it's bound to result in all of the problems that we're currently seeing and what I'm currently treating in my practice. I think the first step in this whole process is to educate yourself. I am a skeptic of a first order, and when I first was presented this information, besides being shocked by it, I decided I needed to look into the science. If I'm going to make recommendations on the basis of the health of my patients, if I have a professional obligation to them to provide the most optimal care, I needed to know that this was true. It just wasn't another fad diet that was going to disappear uh, in a six months to be replaced by something else and to have no positive impact uh, in my patient's health. I spent a good deal of time and I continue to spend time doing research on this diet, proving it to myself. And I've included links to all the relevant sources of the information that I found helpful below this video screen. There will be a little drop down carrot on the lower right section of the screen. You can click on that and all of the links to the information that I think would be important for you to review if you're going to consider making this change, and I hope you do, will be in that drop down menu. Also, spend some time, read about this, watch videos about it, think about it, participate. There are plenty of online bulletin boards, uh, Facebook groups, plenty of sources of information where you can communicate. My practice is uh, a broad one. I spend a fair amount of time talking with my patients about it, but the truth is there just isn't enough time and it is something you have to pursue on yourself. In addition, take time. This is a process that evolves over time. You know, you spent decades with a specific eating habit. This will represent one of the most difficult changes of your life as far as the, the challenges associated with um, disengaging yourself from our Western diet. It also has the most significant health impact. Ultimately, what's more valuable to you? The Five Guys Cheeseburger or good health for your lifetime? I think you know the answer to that question. Well, actually, there are many reasons, and sometimes beyond just human health, this diet appeals to people for other reasons. I'd like to say one of the first reasons is the economic question. You know, I've observed human health long enough now that I can see an obvious trend. Most of my patients literally will die over a 20 or 25 year period. They will develop the seeds of these chronic diseases in young adulthood. They begin to put on weight. In their 30s and early 40s, the blood pressure goes up, the diabetes occurs, the cholesterol goes up, they're on medication. Into their 50s, they begin developing symptoms of heart disease. They see the cardiologist, they get a stent, they have a heart attack. The diabetes begins causing some numbness and tingling in their legs. The circulation in the feet 
begins to become impaired and they're having difficulty walking. So over the course of a 20 or 30 year period, they begin to lose their ability to interact with the world, they begin to lose their cognitive function, their memory begins to fade, they uh, are, lose their ability to, to engage in life, and they become enslaved by the healthcare system by the costs of their pharmaceuticals, by the need to be at a doctor's office or their specialist office, by the procedures that require hospitalization. They lose their ability to make choices in life, they progressively lose their fortune, and at the end of life, the rest of what balance of their money is left is often spent in an assisted living situation for however many months that they linger. I would like to see something different. I, I think humans have a lifespan that's relatively fixed, but I would like the last 20 or 30 years of life to be as good as the initial 40 or 50 or 60. And I believe that's possible by avoiding chronic diseases. And as I've stated before, the way to do that is to radically alter your diet. The goal is to have a long, healthy, functional, happy life where you have all of the capacity that you had when you first came into it, and to have a rather quick, hopefully unexpected and rapid death at a ripe old age. I think that's possible, but as you know and as you look around, that is not typical right now. So do you want to spend your money on your health, or do you want to spend it taking vacations to Italy, putting your grandkids uh, through uh, taking your grandkids on vacation, having fun with your, your family, and spending it on what you want to. That economic decision is a big one. Another good reason is uh, for this diet is the fact that animal cruelty is a significant problem. You know, the source of all the animal-based foods, the eggs, the chicken, the pork, the beef, is large industrial animal farms. This is an unspeakable cruelty that's being inflicted on these gentle, innocent animals. They're kept in horrific conditions. All of their natural instincts are thwarted by the human husbanding of their lives. They are slaughtered, in effect, in their childhood and adolescence so that we can make meals out of them. And I think that anyone that eats animal byproducts is endorsing or complicit in this process. Finally, uh, an issue that I think should be considered is that of our environment, planetary health, if you will. Agribusiness is devastating our environment. Uh, rainforests are currently being taken down at a record rate, principally to form fields so that farming can occur or to form spaces where animal husbandry can occur. Most of the farming that's taken, uh, that's brought on by the rainforest, by the deforestation, is to make um, food for animals, not for humans. The loss of the rainforests and the large growth of agribusiness has resulted in a significant alteration in greenhouse gases. Uh, currently, we believe that the petrochemical industry and internal combustion engines um, produce a uh, majority of greenhouse gases, but there are uh, quite a few uh, new science-related uh, considerations that suggest that the agribusiness is another significant source of greenhouse gas, particularly uh, methane, which has a more significant greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide. So if you care about the planet, and if you care about how animals are treated, particularly by humans, and you care about finances, these are very good reasons to consider this diet. One other thought is just a sort of a overarching um, consideration here is that the diet that is the healthiest for humans happens to be the diet that is best for animals and keeps them from the least amount of cruelty and it happens to be the best for our environment. As far as I'm concerned, this is a win for all parties involved. Uh, this is a complicated answer, and I'm only beginning to understand bits and pieces of it. I, initially, money and influence are the most significant, obvious answers. If you're the American dairy uh, 
industry, you're not going to go away. Uh, I think that you are, you know, the, the financial impact of the dairy industry is dramatic. People that are in the dairy industry have been doing what they do for years, for generations, in fact. Um, and dairy is bad for you. I can tell you as a physician that it causes all of the diseases that I've talked about, and I mean dairy in all of its forms, uh, be, whether it be ice cream, whether it be uh, yogurt, whether it be butter, whether it be cow's milk. Um, so the dairy industry, for instance, and I'm picking on it right now, um, has its influence through its lobbyists in the halls of Congress. And um, the, the food industry in general, as massive as it is, influences our government recommendations. Um, they're not suddenly going to one day think, oh, oops, we've got it wrong all this time. Let's switch to food, uh, although I hope someday that does happen. Uh, in addition, uh, healthcare agencies like the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, C Susan G. Komen Foundation um, are agencies that are also supported by the food industry. You know, you look at a list of corporate sponsors or if any of these, you will see that the food industry supplies them with quite a bit of funding. So you can imagine the political difficulty it is for a healthcare agency to start to make recommendations that would run afoul of their corporate sponsors. You know, the, one of the most cruel paradoxes that I have found is that when you look at the websites of these healthcare agencies, their menus are often, uh, they'll, they'll provide a menu for, I'll give you an example, the American Diabetes Association provides a menu for uh, appropriate diet for a diabetic. And what we find is that the, the food that they recommend uh, is significantly proven to cause the diseases that they purport, they purport to fight. So it really is a, a frustrating paradox that has to be overcome. Finally, I think ignorance is significant. You know, any significant change in the way that we do things um, is a process that is a slow evolution. And I use the 20th century um, tobacco industry as an example of this slow evolution. Um, we mass produced cigarettes in the late 19th century and by the end of World War I, um, cigarette rise was on a dramatic rise in this, uh, cigarette use was on a dramatic rise in this country. And it became clear in the 1930s and 1940s that we were having a associated dramatic rise in chronic respiratory diseases and diseases of the heart. And it became increasingly clear to um, scientists that cigarette smoking was not healthy. Uh, and cigarette smoking in this country peaked about the early 1950s and has been in slight decline, or was in slight decline until the Surgeon General's report in 1964. The government in 1964 published the Surgeon General's report on the hazards of smoking uh, as a public service. It's estimated that it literally took about 7,000 scientific articles showing the uh, toxic effects of cigarettes on humans before the Surgeon General's report actually came out. So when we look at the food industry and we look at the effects of our current diet on our health, I recognize that we're still in the, in the infancy of this evolution and it's going to take time. Part of the reason I'm making this video is to uh, bring awareness to this problem and, uh, and hopefully add my voice to a growing groundswell of support that eventually will lead to markedly better health for all of us. Just a couple of additional comments. You know, modern medical science is very reductionistic. We want to take a complex problem. Uh, human health. We want to break it down into its individual components. And these more simple individual components can then be treated. Uh, it's, uh, we look at, I'll give an example, a patient that will walk in my office with several different chronic health problems. I'll often break that down into given health problems. Let's address your diabetes at this visit. Let's address your high blood pressure. Let's address your smoking. Let's address your degenerative joint disease. Let's address your sleep apnea. Let's address your dementia. I think we would be far better off by looking at this in a much more holistic way than a reductionistic way. And by that I mean the big picture. 
An individual sitting in front of me is a summary of multiple different processes ongoing at the same time. Uh, the interesting feature of all of this is that the influence of the diet affecting all of the chronic diseases is the most effective and efficient way to address this. So I plan to spend my time addressing that in, a, in the most efficient way that I can. And looking at the diet is that efficiency. I think the final um, idea I've already made, but I'd like to make it again, the, in order to change the way that we think about our health and our food, I think we need to bridge a gap. Uh, a wise man once said that the food industry knows nothing about health, and the health industry knows nothing about food. If we can bridge that gap, if we can bring the understanding and the knowledge from the health industry into the food industry and get them to recognize that they can still make money by putting quality plant-based food on the table, I think we can improve our overall health as a nation and we can be far better off because of it.